Jesus said in a command that's at the core of the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How do we go about seeking first the kingdom of God? Talked to a young mom years ago and she felt like, I used to be able to do that in college because I had time to do devotions on a regular basis, but now with little kids, I don't. And I want to say that seeking first is not primarily about having a regular devotional time. And it is not something that get, having kids or anything else in our circumstances gets in the way of. It's available all the time. We are learning from the greatest teacher of all time, Jesus of Nazareth. The greatest teaching of all time, the Sermon on the Mount, what's insurmountable in our lives, not our circumstances, is not the kids, it's not problems. It's God and his presence and his kingdom. And the kingdom is just God being available, God at work, and God is always at work, and we can look for him. So uh, I was just recently in Oklahoma City preaching at Crossings Church. Hello to everybody at Crossings. I'm so grateful that's become kind of a church away from home. And I was flying back home. Uh, I had to take a two-legged flight, and it went through Denver Airport. Our oldest child, Laura, had been in New York at the ordination service of a friend at Old Dutch First Reformed Church. Really cool journey for her. And I knew we were traveling on the same weekend. Uh, I, I had almost called her up when I was in Oklahoma City, but I figured by that time she'd be on a flight. And for some reason in my head, I was thinking it'd be a direct flight back to San Francisco. It was not. It turns out that she also was on a two-legged flight, but I hadn't called her about that. I landed in Denver. And I was talking to Nancy and she said, I think Laura was going to fly through Denver. And so I hung up on Nancy and I called Laura and said, I'm at the food court, Terminal B of Denver Airport. Where are you? She was literally 30 feet away from me eating at Elway's restaurant in the Denver airport. She's watching me waving while I'm walking through, thinking that we're like opposite parts of the country or something. I almost missed my daughter. It was such a gift, and especially to have it be something where we hadn't planned on it, we hadn't orchestrated this, it just happened. And so we had dinner together there, and it was like we couldn't talk fast enough to catch each other up. Lots going on in our lives, real deep stuff, some joyful, some very poignant, some very tender. But man, what a gift. And to think, I almost walked past somebody I loved sitting a couple of feet away from me because I didn't know to look. And I think, how many times do I walk past, here's God present, here is Jesus in my life, here is his gift, um, here is a flower growing in the field, and, and God gave that as a gift to the earth, and I get to enjoy that. Here is the birds of the air, and God's taking care of them, and I can notice them and think about how God, how good God is. Here's an eclipse of the sun going on. Here's God present, God giving all the time. Now, sometimes people will tell stories, I know, I know, I know, and kind of artificially try to manufacture a God sighting or a God event as though in the airport, nobody else really matters, nothing else really matters, it's just all orchestrated around me. There can be these kind of narcissistic, superstitious accounts of seeing God, and we don't want to do that in a glib way. On the other hand, Sometimes we just become kind of practical deists where, yep, there's God and he's out there someplace, but not really involved or engaged in my life. So in this moment, when I'm at this airport, does God know what the flight schedules are? Yeah, he probably does. Is God aware of the fact that Laura and I are both in Denver, in Terminal B, in the food court? Yeah, he probably is. Does God have any feelings about it? If I and somebody I love can connect with each other and talk and meet and experience joy? Yeah, he probably does. So in some way to recognize God is deeply engaged. It is no problem for God to keep track of every event in the life of every person. If I know my child is going to be someplace and have a joyful experience, I experience joy around that. Well, God uh, is at least as competent as I am and much more deeply aware and much better. So seek first, look for God, every good and perfect gift, look for those. Where am I walking right now? How is Jesus present here? How can I see his goodness to me? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
And that brings me actually to the part of the Sermon on the Mount that I want to talk about. If you've been going through this on a regular basis, if you haven't, you might want to do that. But if you have, we're actually in the seventh chapter of the Sermon on the Mount now. And when you think about what does it mean to seek for his righteousness, that's what we're coming to. Really, the whole magnificent ethical spiritual history of Israel is largely unpacking that word. Dikaiosune is the Greek word for it. Plato wrote a lot about it. Uh, so it's got a very, very rich history. It's really what makes somebody good from the outside, as our friend Dallas would say. I'm sorry, what makes somebody good from the inside? That is not about outward conformity. It's a person who is genuinely loving and joyful and patient and generous and so. And so over the years, uh, the writings of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Micah, what does the Lord require of you? Uh, seek justice and love mercy and walk humbly before your God. All of those great sayings are summarized by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount is kind of the cliff notes on everything that's written about it, all of the law and the prophets. Don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I haven't come to abolish but fulfill them. And then the Sermon on the Mount is a summary. It's the cliff notes of the law and the prophets. But wait, there's more. He's not done yet. He's actually going to give the cliff notes on the cliff notes. And this is an absolutely brilliant encapsulation of everything in Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 that the law and the prophets taught he says therefore do unto others whatever you would have others do unto you for this sums up the law and the prophets we're going to take a little while to unpack this is called the golden rule um, but what I want to notice in particular right now is that word, therefore, or so. What's Jesus referring to? Well, of course, he's talking about what's just what he's been discussing. And he's been discussing in chapter 7, and this is where it all hangs together. And it's so worth noticing this. Wrong ways of relating to people. Don't judge. Don't point out the speck in their eye. you got a plank in your own. That's your judgmentalism. The pearl of the pig. Don't. Don't force your great pearls of wisdom on other people when they don't want them. Instead, the way that we relate is to ask. Ask, seek, and knock. Therefore, do to others. Because um, we are free now to relate to other people out of the richness and the goodness of God's care for us. I am not relying on the response of other people for my own well-being. And I want to point out right now a very similar teaching in the book of James so that we understand the connection. So in James chapter 4, James writes, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, the battle within you? So these are relationships gone wrong, just like Jesus has been talking about in Matthew chapter 7. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. And that's not being metaphorical there. Like in that day, people would actually do that stuff. People do that stuff in our day. Uh, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motive so that you can spend whatever you want on your pleasures. There is not righteousness inside you yet. So we ask, we come before God and ask. And then he goes on to say, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law. Talks about becoming a judgmental person. So it's exactly the same teaching here in James as Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount, that it's living in the reality of the kingdom. And the first law of the kingdom is ask. I live a life where I'm seeking to be generous, to give as God does, to bless. And then because God is blessing me, God is watching me like he does the birds in the air, and clothing the grass, the field, then I'm able to be generous with other people. And when I want something, I ask. I seek first. And then I ask, God, would you help me? And that's what enables me. That's what gives me the abundance and the strength and the resources and the sanity to be able to seek a golden rule life with somebody else. So we're going to keep living in that golden rule for a bit. For today, 
look for the kingdom. You're walking through the food court in Terminal B and there's somebody that you love that can see you. And that's Jesus. And he's here, and he's here, and he's here. Look for him today. In the face of a friend, in the smile of somebody that loves you, in a good word, in a thought that reorients you. Oh man, I was going to go down this road. I was going to be less than my best self, but I'm called to goodness that comes from the inside. Joy, a laugh, something you can share with somebody else, something that you can learn. The simple realization that you are loved by God right now. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Do unto others what you would have others do unto you. Because you know that the Heavenly Father is the one that's watching out for you so you can have the power and freedom to love other people. Make it a golden rule day. If you enjoyed that teaching, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes in this series, Insurmountable, which is all about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You can also head over to our website, becomenew.com, where we have over 700 10-minute teachings, all dedicated to helping you grow spiritually one day at a time. My name's Tim, and I'm a part of the team here at Become New. hey Just want you to know this is so much more than a YouTube channel. It's really a community of people who are brought together not by our strengths or our ability to achieve, but by our weaknesses and our need for help from God. So we're glad that you're here. If you have a prayer request, there's a group of us who meet each weekday, Monday through Friday, to pray for viewers just like you. So you can send us your request to the number 855-888-0444. We'd love to pray for you. We're glad that you're here. We'll catch you next time.